Thank you, and uh, welcome back. You know, as, uh, as Jada notes, I was just on the Kojo Namdi show, and for those of you who are not from, I know we have representatives from 30 countries here. This is a local radio program. Uh, but I got a question from a woman who is part of a campaign called the One Campaign and had been to rural Kenya and had seen a Feed the Future farm and program. And, she, and this has genuinely never happened to me on air. She called in just to say thank you because uh, you make her proud to be an American. And, uh, and I just thought that was very touching and also exceedingly rare, <laughs> given, the, <laughs> given the range of other issues that we tend to have to address in public. Uh, so we have, uh, one of the things that's been special about this forum over three days is, is that we have highlighted that this is not uh, an initiative run uh, as a USAID program. This is a presidential initiative, and President Obama first introduced the concept of helping smallholder farmers uh, and improving agriculture elsewhere during his State of the Union address. He used his first G20 to raise the resources and launch this effort. And, uh, and during the times that he was doing that, I was not actually at USAID. I was uh, at USDA, proud to work for your next speaker, Secretary Tom Vilsack. Uh, in addition to inviting me to be part of this administration and uh, being one of the originators of the concept of Feed the Future, Secretary Vilsack has pulled together USDA in a way that I don't think has ever been done before to make sure that every part of what is a truly massive and all-encompassing agency is using its intellectual capacity, its scientific capacity, its presence and ability to be on the ground and in schools feeding kids and elsewhere uh, to advance the goals of addressing hunger and poverty through a comprehensive uh, farm to table approach. And uh, aside from just being the best ag secretary I think we've ever had, and a good friend, um, and a fan of Pittsburgh sports, although I would note I'm from around Detroit, and our Tigers are doing awfully well <laughs> relative to your team this year, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> but uh, aside from all that, I am very, very pleased to introduce Secretary Tom Vilsack. Well, uh, Raj, thanks very much for that very uh, enlightening and innovative introduction. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I really appreciate the close personal friendship and relationship I have with Dr. Shaw. He's, uh, he's a real star. Uh, you all know that uh, and I'm thrilled to have him at USAID. I will tell you that I, I have often said that I will never ever receive uh, another 6.30 in the morning phone call from Hillary Clinton. Uh, she called me at 6.30 in the morning. I was barely awake. Hadn't had my coffee. She said, I just have a small favor. Is it okay if we steal Raj Shah from your operation and take him over to USAID? And I said, you know, I didn't even think. I said, well, yeah, yeah you know, sure, no problem. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, but, you know, I I've got some remarks here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about them, but before I do, I'm, I was struck by what Raj just said uh, in terms of his radio interview. Um, and I think it's great that we get the New York Times to write about Feed the Future. I mean, it's terrific. But we really need to get to a different level with this debate and conversation. We probably already have the vast majority of people who are New York Times subscribers understand the significance of this effort. They probably understand that there's a moral call that a great nation has, every great nation has, to help less fortunate folks. And they probably understand that it's in our national security interest to create relationships, to build economies, to you know, create middle classes to f feed hungry children. They probably already understand that. But the place where I do most of my work, in rural areas of this country, they may not fully understand that. 
not, not because they uh, aren't interested, but, but just that we don't ever really talk to folks across the country about why it's important to support programs like Feed the Future. I mean, you, you know the statistic and the, the constant talking point that, you know, when you ask people, well, how much money do we spend on foreign aid, and I think it's some outrageous percentage of our overall budget, and it's just a minuscule amount, it shows a need for us uh, to reach out and to explain that it's not just the right thing, but it's in our self-interest to do this. Uh, and the, the President and then Secretary Clinton, now Secretary Kerry and, and Dr. Shaw, they have a vision here, which you all uh, I know share, which is that if you focus time, attention and resources with the emphasis on the word focus, you can actually make a difference in people's lives. And I think Feed the Future, as it's been implemented and as it's been improved and modified, I think is proving that point. And we at USDA are proud to be part of this effort. We play a supporting role, and it's appropriate that we play a supported role. Uh, in order for us to be as supportive as we can, it was necessary that we look at our entire range of interests and missions at USDA to make sure that we had an integrated approach to our Feed the Future initiative. It wasn't it wasn't just going to be the foreign ag service. It wasn't just going to be the research and extension education folks focused on this. This was going to be across the board. How can all aspects of USDA be engaged and, and be, be inspired to be part of this effort? So we established our, our Global Food Security Council, which is made up of representatives from all the mission areas that have a stake and have an interest and can contribute to the Feed the Future initiative. And it's now being ably led by Suzanne Palmieri, and they are meeting on a regular basis, and they are coordinating their efforts with their colleagues at USAID, and I think it's provided for a more effective approach. And one of the things that we realized once we became integrated and coordinated was that we, too, needed to focus, that we couldn't be all things to all people, and we couldn't be everywhere as much as we would like to be, and as much as the need is everywhere. So we realized that we could do three things pretty well. We could build in-country capacity in terms of agriculture. We could really help with statistical analysis, marketing information, economic analysis, and data collection so that countries would really have a better understanding of precisely what was happening in-country which in turn would create enough predictability and, and consistency to begin establishing real markets, which is what really creates the opportunity. And that we had, uh, obviously, a, a great opportunity to use our basic and applied research to advance the cause. So it was focusing, first and foremost, on our core missions. And then it was understanding, again, that we couldn't be everywhere. Uh, Feed the Future roughly focusing on 19 countries and regions. We felt that we could be contributing in East Africa, that we could be contributing in Central America, that we could focus time, attention, and resources on specific countries like Haiti, Guatemala, Ghana, Kenya, Bangladesh. So with that focus and with that geographic focus, we went to work. I just want to give you a couple of examples of the progress that's been made because I think it, it's, it speaks volumes about the importance of what we're doing and I think it also speaks volumes about the approach that we've taken and its success. You'll read the report, but our in-country capacity has actually assisted 145,000 producers across this geographic area that we're engaged in in actually improving productivity. It's the 12,000 smallholders in Bangladesh who now have a better understanding if, of how to make their livestock aquaculture or the horticulture activities more productive. It's the 5,400 smallholders in Kenya who now are developing a new modern poultry production system that's going to allow them to increase significant productivity. It's the information we're providing to producers in Guatemala who want to access the U.S. market, 
but now are confronted with this Food Safety Modernization Act and all of its requirements, knowing and understanding those requirements so that they're in a position to make uh, a co contribution to the market of fruits and vegetables and opening up opportunity. That's what our people have been engaged in in terms of in-country capacity. Market information, statistics, and analysis, it's really about working with governmental entities and formulating the right kind of policy that helps to create markets, that helps to co collect the data appropriately. And we've had, in the last year, seven serious policy reforms that we've assisted to improve uh, primarily export opportunities. And we've seen an increase in exports. Now, what I'm really excited about is what we've done in our basic and applied research. Aflatoxin is a huge issue in many parts of Africa. We've created, through our science, and we've tested a biological control which we believe will actually substantially reduce that risk, and in fact, it's been tested, been sampled, been harmonized uh, in terms of uh, rules and regulations and registration requirements. So we're now in a position to commercialize this product. That's gonna have a profound impact on production. Or it's the vaccine uh, that we established for uh, East Coast fever that's going to have a significant impact on improving productivity. It's going to make such a difference. And it's going to build relationships. You know, at the end of the day, Feed the Future is really about relationships. It's the, about the ability to create enough trust so that when we say to a farmer in Kenya, you can plant corn, and you can plant soybeans at the same time in the same place as your father did, and your grandfather did, and your grandfather's grandfather did, and you can still create product. But if you trust us that if you plant those on different years, your productivity will increase to the point that you'll be able to purchase a second dairy cow, and you won't just supply milk for your family, you'll supply it for your neighbor's family, and you'll create additional income which will allow you to extend beyond the half hectare that you own to a larger farming operation. That's the power of relationships. That's the power of giving information that works. That's what Feed the Future is all about. But it isn't just related to the mission of Feed the Future. There are other ways in which we are coordinating with USAID in its overall mission. Because a critical component of this is people have to be fed at the end of the day and they have to be well fed, starting with the children. And the reality is in the US government, we oftentimes have multiple agencies with multiple programs all trying to do the same thing and all doing it differently and never coming together. Because of the relationship that I have with Dr. Shaw, well actually because of the relationship I have with my wife who works for Dr. Shaw, Our dinner, room our dinner room conversation has really changed, Raj. I'm just telling you. Uh, we're sitting at dinner one night, and Christy starts talking about USAID's nutrition programs. And I'm thinking to myself, well, wait a second. We have the McGovern Dole program. And that helps somewhere between two and a half to four million kids a year access food at school. Isn't that? consistent with what you all are doing, trying to do in Guatemala, for example? Why aren't we coordinating this? Why aren't we leveraging those programs to the maximum efficiency and effectiveness? Why aren't we making sure that whatever we do in Guatemala with our feeding program is supporting your effort to help 100 million kids read better or to help young women in war-torn countries have an opportunity to uh, to, to live a fruitful life. Why aren't we coordinating this effort? Well, that led to a conversation between our uh, two teams, and eventually we ended up just recently signing uh, an MOU that's going to provide for better alignment and better utilization of this McGovern Dole program. And it is a powerful program. I, I, I saw it personally. Um, my staff early in the first administration decided that I needed to see a feeding site, and they chose an orphanage in Kenya for me to go to. It was particularly um, emotional for me to do this because I, I started out life in an orphanage. I was adopted into a family in Pittsburgh. 
So I felt that I had a connection with these kids. Obviously, their circumstances a lot different than mine. But we kind of started out life in the same place. And my job uh, at this facility in, in Kenya was to basically provide the, the meal that these kids were getting as a result of a government dole. They had little red cups, the World Feeding Program, and we were filling those cups with kind of a combination of, 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 of food that was highly nutritious. It looked a little bit like oatmeal, but, but, but these kids were anxious and they stood in line for it. And I had a chance to visit with some of these kids as they were going through the line, and I basically said, what do you like about school? Now, I asked that question because as a former governor and former mayor, I'd ask that question to American kids all the time. And I'd get a wide range of answers. You know, some kids would say, oh, I really like recess. Some kids would say, I really love math, or I'm really interested in science. To a person, these kids said, I like school because it's where I get fed. That's a really powerful notion. And it creates the opportunity to develop the relationship because those kids will connect being fed with being educated with the United States. And over time, that will make a difference because those kids will eventually be the leaders of their village, of their community, of their country. And it will make us just a safer and better place. So coordinating our nutrition programs, in addition to the work that we specifically do in Feed the Future, is a way of advancing uh, the effort. I want to make a few additional points. And that is that we can help on the perimeter of all of this with some of our other initiatives at USDA. We believe very strongly, and the President's been very clear about this, that publicly supported research ought to be available to the public and not just the public in the U.S. So we've established an open data initiative in which we're unlocking the vaults, if you will, of USDA research and making it available uh, to people all over this country and all over the world. And we're working with other G7 countries and working with other nations to create uh, a global open data initiative that will enable researchers all across the world to have access to information that we've been able to glean over the course of decades. We combine that with our efforts under the Global Research Alliance in 41 countries to more specifically address the challenge that every country has, especially those who are in the Feed the Future realm, of how to deal with a changing climate and its impact and effect on production. We can do everything right and feed the future, but if Mother Nature decides to turn up the temperature a bit, that can fundamentally affect and change the way in which people farm and what they can produce. And we should never take for granted that what we're growing today and what we're raising today will be able to raise tomorrow. And we're beginning to see already the signs of a changing climate and its impact pests and diseases, uh, significant more intense weather patterns, longer droughts, more severe storms, all of this having an impact. So we are engaged in this research alliance with 41 countries to try to make sure we don't duplicate our research efforts and that we make sure that the rest of the world has access to what we're finding out about crop production, about livestock production, and about rice production. We're going to combine that effort with an effort that we are engaged with the World Bank and others to establish sort of the standard of what a climate smart agriculture actually looks like so that we can, we can educate ourselves and the world about precisely what we need to do to increase productivity across the board because we have this huge challenge of meeting an ever-increasing world population at the time that climate is making it more difficult, at the time that water resources are scarce, at a time when the amount of land available for production begins to shrink because of expanding uh, communities. So we're working with governments, we're working with farm organizations, scientists and others to try to figure out how can we become more productive, how can we make agriculture more resilient globally, 
and what can we do to make sure that we reduce and or eliminate in certain circumstances the greenhouse gas emissions connected to agriculture. It's a huge undertaking with very aspirational goals, but certainly fits into the effort uh, that Feed the Future is about. And finally, as we begin to develop relationships, it is also about making sure that our brightest and best and other countries' brightest and best have an opportunity to exchange and talk, which is why we have been so supportive of the Borlaug Fellowships and the Cochrane Fellowships, using those fellowships to create opportunities for a transfer of knowledge. 390 Borlaug Fellows since I've been Secretary and over 2,600 Cochrane Fellows spending in some cases weeks, in some cases months, working with their counterparts in other parts of the world, including the countries that we're engaged in to feed the future for an exchange of ideas. So it's about building relationships. Uh, it's about expanding opportunity. It's about addressing in a very focused and integrated and coordinated way the huge challenge uh, of, of agricultural productivity. And it's linked to getting people out of poverty and helping them stay out of poverty building stronger economies, and making for a safer world. It's pretty good stuff, and it's the kind of thing we ought to be talking to people around the country about, because it is the kind of thing that makes people proud to be associated with a country that is willing to help, a country that has an understanding of its responsibility, a country that has the compassion to share its resources and its knowledge without fear that somehow this will put our own producers at a disadvantage. It is a great story, but it is an untold story, unfortunately, to far too few Americans, too, or too many Americans. Too many Americans don't know this story. And if they did, the chances, I think, would be good that members of Congress, regardless of their political persuasion, could be convinced that this is an investment worthy of making. This is a great opportunity. Uh, we look forward to continually working with USAID, and we appreciate the fact that they've allowed us to be part of this great and, I think, uh, compelling and inspiring initiative. Thank you very much. The secretary has a few minutes to take a few questions, so this is a, a rare and important opportunity. So rare that nobody uh, has a question. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah, that's good, because that, I can't, there we go. My name is Jose Garcia. I am the extension director for Guatemala. I'm representing the Ministry of Agriculture right now. And when you mentioned that when a government has uh, the total decision to support rural development, integrate rural development, as our government is doing, I think uh, we are very well, uh, we are grateful that we have this opportunity that we can share and we can also uh, be supported by the effort of Feed the Future and other efforts like uh, USDA. So we really appreciate, and uh, as I mentioned, you know, this decision of bringing back the extension service to the whole country in Guatemala has been for us our best decision. So thanks a lot, uh, and we appreciate what you are doing also to your level. Well, I, I appreciate that comment, and I had an opportunity and a privilege to be with uh, the Minister of Agriculture from Guatemala on Monday uh, in Mexico City when we were on a panel uh, discussing uh, uh, the trade opportunities that exist between your country, uh, the United States, Mexico, and Canada. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's amazing to me uh, how popular extension is when I travel overseas. Uh, the idea of getting information is one thing, and being able to deliver it in the field is something completely uh, different. And we in this country, unfortunately, I think, take extension for granted, and we shouldn't. Uh, it is a marvelous thing to be able to transfer that knowledge and so that it actually works. But it is, again, about relationships. It's, again, about, you know, if I tell you something and you don't know me, you may or may not accept it, but if you and I have been working together for a period of time, 
and I say, if you try this, it might work better, you're willing to try it. So it is important for us to have those relationships, which is why the decision that the administrator made uh, to, to really have us focus on a few countries in a very more in-depth way allows us to create those relationships. And once those relationships are created and once the knowledge is available and the systems are, are, are created to extend the knowledge, then you, you're sort of on your own. You can, you, you can support yourself. You don't need us, right? That's the goal. That's the goal. And then all of a sudden, your producers are more productive. You create market opportunities for them to trade uh, outside of Guatemala. You bring resources into the country. You create employment opportunities. You build middle classes. You build consumers for your own products domestically. And you build a stronger and more stable country. And if you're, more, if you're stronger and more stable, then the region is stronger and stable, more stable. I mean, it's a, a pretty simple equation here, difficult to implement, but a very simple and per very powerful notion. Jim Hershey with the American Soybean Association's WISH program. Thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for an excellent description of the important work your agency's doing with AID and, and uh, agricultural development uh, internationally. Your agency has a lot of experts, uh, ag economists, ag development people, uh, people like a lot of the people in the room and me, uh, Return Peace Corps volunteers. And you're doing a great job with the uh, Office of Capacity uh, Building and Development. How can we in the private sector, how can we in the, the agricultural sector also uh, get involved and help feed the future? Well, first of all, I, I, I need to say that the American Soybean Association has been a terrific partner. Uh, there has been a commitment by the association and soybean growers in this country uh, to work with their colleagues and with their uh, with farmers all across the world. So with, without the association, without the assistance and help of the Soybean Association, we wouldn't be as far along as we are. Uh, so first and foremost, continuing to do what you're, what you're doing. Uh, I think this, this ability for American farmers to find the time and the resources to travel overseas uh, to see for themselves firsthand where agriculture is in some of these countries and things that can be done a and having an understanding how how difficult this is to encourage I mean if you think about it if I'm trying to encourage you to do something that you and your family and your family's family have done for decades it's not an easy thing to convince you to do something different you, it's risky and developing a relationship and, and allowing American farmers to see that, they'll have a better understanding of what it takes. And I think they'll be more supportive of the efforts that uh, Raj and his team have and our team has at USDA. And they'll be able to communicate that to their friends and neighbors in the coffee shop. So when someone says, by God, I don't have any idea why we're spending money overseas. We ought to be fixing up the road down the, down the, you know, down the street from my place it needs, you know, that's where we ought to be investing. We ought to be investing in the United States. This is investing in the United States. It, it absolutely is investing in the United States because it's going to create a more secure world. And a more secure world would mean that we won't necessarily have to spend as much as we are currently spending on keeping ourselves secure. So it, it, it's, I think, empowering your, the farmers of this country to be engaged in this effort. And frankly, it's in their best interest because not only is there a message issue with reference to Feed the Future, there's a message issue generally with agriculture in this country. There is an, a lack, in my view, of an appreciation, a full appreciation for what the farmers of this country have done for us. Uh, and having farmers more engaged in this and more publicly engaged in this, I think will allow the rest of America to, to essentially begin to think more clearly about American agriculture, the benefits it gives to us, the, the freedoms that we have to pursue other lines of work and other occupations because we've delegated the responsibility of feeding our families to a really small percentage because they're so good at what they do. So I think you can be great communicators both overseas and in your local community. I would think that's one of the most important things you could do. Yeah, thank you so much for accepting to take our questions. My name is uh, Agnes Kalibata. I'm the Minister of Agriculture from, and Animal Resources from Rwanda. I just wanted to say thank you for supporting uh, the African continent uh, with, with the Feed the Future. 
This year is Africa's year of agriculture, and I just wanted to remind everybody that this is a time where so much has been achieved. When you look back to see what the continent has done, so much has been achieved. And I just want to encourage people that there's room to do more, and we, we, we are ready to work, to work with you uh, to, do, to do much more to, to make sure that this, this continent is also self-sufficient in food. Secondly, I wanted to encourage to keep encouraging you on, on the, the scholarship that you mentioned. I'm a product of some of those scholarships, and I'm doing part of my responsibility on the continent to make sure that, so you, that, that we are food secure. So you already, the American government is already contributing through these, these scholarships. So yes, it's, it's a good way to reach out to the continent. It's a good way to do the right thing, and I encourage you to keep doing more. Thank you very much. Well, um, yeah. We, as a humankind, face an enormous challenge, which is to increase food population, food production. You pick a number, 40%, 50%, between now and 2050, to be able to feed 9 or 10 billion people on this earth. Candidly, the ability to increase productivity in the United States can be increased, but it's very incremental because we've made such huge uh, leaps already. So if we're gonna meet this challenge, it's gonna be not be met necessarily in the Midwest of this country. It's gonna be met in the areas that Feed the Future is engaged in, specifically the African continent, Southern, Southeast Asia, uh, uh, Central America and Latin America. That's where the productivity gains can be most significant. And there is just so much of an opportunity, but it does require uh, a relationship. It does require work, it does, it, and it requires trust, and it, it's gonna take time. And we, frankly, are running out of time. And this would be, under normal circumstances, pretty difficult, then when you add to it the changing climate and the impact of climate change on all of this, it, it, it makes it even more daunting. But, but it can be done, and it needs to be done. Uh, and and but in order for us to do this, we need to develop, you mentioned the, the, the notion of scholarships. This is a much larger point that you raise, and that is that this country has got to figure out its immigration system so that those scholarships and those exchanges can be more easily done. Uh, today it's a little bit more difficult, and because we don't have comprehensive immigration reform, we are limiting those opportunities, and it's an unfortunate circumstance because it limits that ability to create that relationship. It limits the ability of somebody to learn uh, new practices that they can take back, uh, and at the end of the day, it makes it just a little bit more difficult to do than, than it would otherwise be. So not only is this Feed the Future initiative important in terms of climate change, in terms of agricultural production, but it is also a reminder that this country's got to fix its immigration system, and, and needs to fix it soon. Thank you all very much.